I'm Patrick Brady, chair of MBTA's Young Professional Group. And I'm Orion Green, and I sit on a chair. And this is... Maine Better. Better, where we discuss community and connection for the Maine Better Transportation Association. Let's try that. Let's try it again. And this is Maine Better. Better. <laughs> where we we'll have just... to work on that. <laughs> With us today is Representative Chloe Maxman, who is running for uh, the Maine Senate seat for District 13. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me on. Glad to have you on. And is it true that Katniss Everdeen came from your district? <laughs> is that true? <laughs> well, that's 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 our Hunger Games joke. District uh, 13 in Maine is much, much, much more gorgeous. That includes Nobleboro, where you're from, and what other towns is that? District 13 is all of Lincoln County except for Dresden, plus Washington and Windsor. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running? My name uh, is Chloe Maxman. I'm 28. I grew up on my family's farm here in Nobleboro, and I can never turn myself away from this beautiful state. I have loved Maine since I can remember and have devoted my life to fighting for our community and our home. Throughout my life, it's taken me in so many different directions, but the one common theme that I began to see is that so much of what we face on a daily basis, so much, so many of the challenges of the struggles, um, and so much of the things that we hope for, they all circle around politics, and politics is made up of the people that we elect. And um, myself, as a constituent, have been so frustrated at almost everybody I've ever elected at the lack of transparency and accountability and accessibility. And I feel like it's for those reasons that we fe that we feel like our interests aren't represented because. How can anybody represent us if they're not listening? Um, it's the same thing that I hear echoed all across my district. So in 2018, I ran for office in uh, House District 88, which is Chelsea Whitefield Jefferson and half of Nobleboro. And I won. I've noticed a few things. One, there really is no excuse for not being accessible. You know, even though it's it's a, I call it my part-time, part-time, full-time job because it's part-time of the year we get paid part-time, but the workload is full-time. So, you know, you only have so many hours in the day to communicate and be there, but there is still ample opportunity, um, untapped opportunity to connect with your community. Um, I also have really learned that nuance is so important in politics. I represent, um, I won with 52.4% of the vote. So I represent um, almost just as many people who didn't vote for me as did vote for me. And I hold all of their interests and I hear from all of them. So it's irresponsible for me as a representative to just fight for, you know, the loud voices that I know voted for me. And it's only through that nuance that I can really bring together all the vast perspectives that, you know, voted for Hillary and voted for Trump or voting for Biden and voting for Trump. You know, I got to hold all of those and that requires a different way of thinking about it. And I think about it more in terms of nuance and real representation than around not being able to take a stand. We usually ask people, what was their first car? But growing up on a farm, maybe your first car was a tractor. Yeah, I learned how to learned how to drive a tractor when I was little. I learned how to drive. Um, we have a farm truck that's a um, Chevy S10 manual, and that's I learned to drive on that. Um, my dad just let me go around in circles in the field, and then automatics are a piece of cake from there. How, how do you feel your days when you're not representing constituents? Yes. Yeah, so since we do not make a living wage in the legislature, I have two other jobs. They both focus on climate change and supporting young folks who are working on, on climate justice issues. Um, and then I'm also campaigning for the state Senate, which um, I do not get paid for. So it's a full, full life right now, but feels very meaningful. How has the pandemic affected uh, the work that you do? When COVID hit, we um, put full on pause on the campaign and pivoted our entire infrastructure and resources towards calling seniors. We already had hundreds of volunteers, a massive network that spanned the district. So we ended up coordinating food, rides, medication, anything that people needed. Um, we got it to them. We made over 13,500 phone calls and had 200 volunteers organize this relief network and it's still still going today because transportation access is really tricky during COVID. Nobody can get a ride to the doctor, especially seniors. And so I help people get rides to the doctor now. And it's it's been 
really intense. What do you see as the biggest transportation challenges in your district? Access. <laughs> I mean, so I think rural transportation access is a different a different thing. And I think in rural communities, I think of transportation as the great equalizer. It's our access to jobs, to childcare, to families, to the bank, to food. You know, unless you have someone who's going to do it for you, if you don't have a car, you're stuck. And I, um, one of my bills in the legislature has focused on trying to expand transportation access for seniors and adults with disabilities who um, can't make it to one of the fixed bus routes, who can't make it um, to one of the coastal bus lines. You know, if you live out in the woods, you need somebody to come to you and pick you up. And those services don't really exist right now, um, at, at least during COVID, and they're very sparse and poorly funded otherwise. So I focused a lot on that. and. Uh, trying to trying to build that up for rural places what do those services look like are those sort of volunteer driven come to your door type ride services or is it something different for doctor's appointments you can get a ride through main care if you're a main care member and um which is of course really important but those drivers aren't paid well um you have to be a main care member the services is, is there's a big demand so it's, it's hard to get a ride um so there are a lot of challenges around it but you can get a ride to the doctor through main care. There's lots of local volunteer efforts around here as well. Um, if folks need a ride to the grocery store, for example, but they're not operating right now because of COVID and a lot of the volunteers are older who don't feel safe driving a stranger. So, um, so my bill was gonna try and come in in the middle and expand main care transportation options to include um, non-emergency, um, non-medical transportation, but for urgent basic needs. So a ride to the pharmacy, for example, a ride to the grocery store. Um, and so we should be back in session because my bill is currently in limbo. It was stuck in committee when we adjourned. And, uh, you know, I hope we go back, but who knows? So, you know, anyways, trying to find trying to find things here that work, it's tricky because so many of the folks in need are are older, there's not good cell phone access here, there's not good internet access, so it's hard to just start a whole new thing. Um, so we're trying to kind of find ways to plug it into something that exists, that people know about, um, that can be funded pretty easily, and just see, yeah, try and figure it out. And I think, you know, there's been lots of talk about um, rail across Maine and different bus routes, which is obviously really important, but still is pretty inaccessible to a senior living alone in the woods. Do you have any thoughts about how we how we do fund uh, transportation and infrastructure in the state? I think a lot of it comes from bonds. These are huge, huge projects that um, you know that there isn't money for in the state budget, and especially now with COVID, we're gonna we are facing and will face such a budget crisis. And I I think it's important that we're rebuilding after COVID in a way that makes us stronger and more resilient. And after seeing what's happened in my community with transportation access, I think investing in transportation for rural places is a huge part of our COVID rebuild. Um, so yeah, bonds, I think also with bills like mine that were, um, that probably would have been funded if it's, if it wasn't for COVID, you know, there are ways that we can provide really targeted services to people who really need it in ways that don't cost a ton of money and um, that provide different models for how we can help folks. So obviously in the long run, it's a huge, huge expense, but I think there are ways that we can we can, we can tackle it through the state budget in manageable ways and then focus on bonding. What is one of your favorite lesser known spots in Maine? Oh, but then everyone's going to go there. Yeah, well, <laughs> that you're willing to share. Yeah, but I'm willing Maybe to your share. second favorite lesser known spot. Yeah. So your first one isn't, isn't uh, too crowded. I love the Pemaquid Lighthouse. It's one of the most spectacular ones in Maine. There's no islands around, it's just ocean and it's so beautiful. Um, and there are ways to get down there that are leave you pretty isolated from the crowds. All right, well, that's all we have today. Thank you so much for joining us, Chloe. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I loved your intro. May the odds be ever in your favor. Thank you. <laughs> that's so funny. Thank you.